question I wanna ask of you. Tell me, don't you think it's time that we made love?
Championship here in lovely San Diego, California. I'm Brooks Clark, joined in the booth today by Johnny Northley once again, and we've got a treat here for you folks, the legend, Ken Legler, head coach of, Tuff, head coach of Tufts University. Uh, certainly no stranger to the team racing or collegiate circuit. Uh, great to have you here with us, Ken. Uh, today we're going to see just fantastic racing. We got through two flights of the opening, uh, the gold round of eight, and we're going to go finish off that a couple more flights. We're about two rounds into it, I think, and then we're going to roll into the final four. So, uh, Johnny, what, what did we see yesterday? What, what are we looking at with the results? Yeah, so uh, at the end of the day yesterday, we got into the, uh, the round of eight, and uh, each team sailed about two or three races. Uh, and we saw uh, Yale take a commanding lead in the regatta. Uh, Yale going uh, two or three and zero oh in that uh, in that round of eight. Uh, Georgetown as well sailing very well, but uh, Yale extending their lead sixteen and one over the field behind them uh, with, with quite the gap. Uh, BC, uh, St. Mary's, and Georgetown all sitting at four losses. So that's a, a pretty big lead for Yale going into uh, the last few races of this round and. Uh, puts them a little more solidly in that conversation for the Final Four. It's going to be tough for, for those teams like Georgetown, BC, and St. Mary's to get back into the conversation to uh, by the end of this round so that they've got a chance, a fighting chance at taking the lead over Yale in the Final Four. Right, John. I think last year we saw Yale go into the Final Four with that. They only needed to win one win because the scores do carry over and everyone counts, especially in this gold round of eight. Kenny, you said you were talking to some of the coaches this morning. What's what's the mentality like out here on the I did, and I'm going to start with Yale. Uh, Zach Leonard did not see this three-race lead as anything uh, close to being insurmountable. Uh, it may look that way on paper with uh, three big uh, races. They only have one loss, and the next team has four. However, uh, Yale still has eight extremely difficult races left, five to go in this gold round of eight, plus three in the final four. And, uh, and all eight races are going to be extremely difficult for any team that's racing against any other team. I spoke to the BC coach in second place, and he said the formula to take overtake Yale is, is simple. Uh, you just split with Yale uh, after the gold round, and then you just beat them in the last round. And then you've got the tiebreaker over them by beating them two out of three. So uh, the, the BC coach <laughs> thinks that uh, any, any team that's currently in the top four or five can still win this. No, that's a great point. We're looking at the results right now. As you were just saying, three teams tied with four losses. The Charleston Cougars are right behind it with five losses and Stanford with six. So I really think that uh, any team right now is certainly in the mix to make that Final Four as we progress through this round of eight. Uh, let's get some predicti predictions, Johnny. What do you think? Uh, who, you think so, who, who are we going to see in that Final Four? Well, uh, I think I'm going to stick to my original Final Four uh, with uh, Yale, Georgetown, uh, St. Mary's, and Charleston. Uh, I think Charleston's going to clean it up as we go through today. Uh, a couple strong races ending this round, and I think we might see BC just miss out. But uh, I don't know, it's going to be tight between those top five or six teams, so uh, it's really anybody's ballgame. Yeah, we did see uh, BC drop their first two races in the opening round yesterday to really kind of put things back together. So I think I'm going to have to agree with you that one, John. I think BC, if they can't get their momentum going, my prediction is going to be Yale, obviously, still running the gauntlet. St. Mary's feeling very consistently, very well. I think the Cougars, maybe I'm a little biased in my alma mater, but I think they're going to sail really well today. I was chatting with some of them this morning. They're fired up and ready to go, and I think the Hoyas are going to be that last team in that Final Four. Hmm. How about you, Ken? Well, let's start at the bottom. I don't think Brown and Dartmouth have a real good shot of winning at, at, at any level, but even getting into the Final Four is going to be hard for them. They've already lost at least one race each in this round. However, they can beat any team, and so they're going to be spoilers. Uh, the other teams in the big battle between second and sixth right now, yes, uh, three of them are going to emerge into the Final Four, uh, along with Yale. Uh, I don't see any way that Yale doesn't make the Final Four. Uh, but, uh, you know, being from New England, I'm, I'm looking at BC to hang in there. I understand that they had a couple bad starts, uh, but they went extremely well downwind uh, after that, and so that if they can get off the line, uh, I, I see them making the Final Four along with St. Mary's and Georgetown. It's tough to pick against Charleston, though. Uh, those three senior skippers and most of the crews uh, have been together now all four years. Uh, they are always the best team in the country in February uh, and going into March. And then Georgetown gets hot in March. And then Yale comes on in April, yeah. <laughs> uh, along with BC, who has had str struggled against Yale the last few years. But boy, they are still a force to be reckoned with. No, absolutely. I think you are kind of brought up an interesting point there, Kenny, how just how the Cougars, as you gravitate farther south, you can get on the water a little bit earlier. Some teams, I believe Dartmouth, uh, has some issues with ice on their lake, and uh, they physically can't sail until later on in the season when it starts to break up, whereas the Cougars 
And uh, as farther south teams, just yeah, it's a little chillier, but they're still able to sail. So I think over the course of the season, we did see, uh, I think that same progression you're saying, those teams, obviously the BCs and the Yales, as they start getting more into the rhythm, chipping the ice off their boats quite literally, uh, start to get their groove, and clearly Yale has found that groove here in San Diego. Yeah, I think that's something that uh, a lot of the New England teams in particular, but uh, no notably Boston College and St. Mary's are really noted for uh, starting off kind of weak as they start to figure out you know, who, who are going to be their three skippers, who's going to be their squad as they go into it, and you just see that clean progression throughout the season, um, and you can literally see it in the results. Just you know, They go from just missing the, the top eight to making the top eight to making the final four, and by the end of the season they've qualified for nationals, and they're here again contending. So. Uh, you know, it's really a trend we've seen, so I think, you know, you make a good point, Ken, that uh, it's, it's really hard to bet against BC at the end of the season, no matter who their players are, because they seem to always get it done. So I'll probably be eating my words by saying they're outside the Final Four, but like we said, it's going to be really, really tight racing, so any of those six teams, you know, wouldn't surprise me if they made it in. John, if I may ask you, you're in St. Mary's Conference. Uh, are they surprising you with how well they're doing, both uh, in this team racing as well as their uh, fleet racing results? I don't think so. Um, I mean, it's something we see from St. Mary's year after year, no matter who their players are. Uh, they do such a good job of giving their second teams over the years uh, experience at second tier regattas and sometimes sending them to the top tier regattas. So their second team is probably the most practiced team in the country. Maybe not in practice time, but in terms of regatta experience. In terms of major regattas. Exactly, yeah. And then they bring in uh, pretty much every year, we were talking about the other day, Brooks, but they bring in their uh, what they call the the super stud week, yeah, uh, and, they, alumni, and, they, uh, and they and they have uh, a group of alumni that, that that come in, uh, guys like Michael Menger, Jesse Kirkland, uh, Justin Law, former All Americans. Uh, I believe they spent this past week. Um, while, while the team was at women's practicing up at Newport Harbor with a bunch of their California alums. So okay. they're, they have the benefit of a really strong alumni base, uh, a lot of really, really talented sailors, really talented team racers. Uh, and it seems like they go into that week and, and by the time they come out, they are just exponentially stronger. Well, that does help explain it. Alex, uh, uh, Alex Curtis in particular, winning A division over Nevin Snow at the uh, Mesa uh, Fleet Racing Championship. Uh, nice kid too, I like that guy. Uh, but uh, still, uh, you know, Nevin Snow is, you know, the, the, the benchmark for, he's, you know, he's the, excellence. He's the reigning Sleep. college of the year. Well, yeah, and Alex <laughs> Curtis to, to knock him off at the, at the America's Trophy. Boy, he's, he's having a hell of a year. Yeah, definitely. It's certainly uh, that, that, that tier up there. You, tr you know, you can start talking now during the Nationals that who's going to be in the conversation for Sailor of the Year. And I think right now, uh, Nevin certainly seen, we still have a whole semifinals and championship fleet racing to have and this regatta wrap up as well. But I feel like right now, Nevin certainly is still uh, looking to re reclaim his, or not reclaim, but uh, defend his title of Sailor of the Year. You, you guys are a little closer to it, so I don't know if you've seen some things that I might have missed just watching on TechScore, but uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, I didn't get to see as much of the high-end team racing as I would like to have. We just uh, suffered through our worst year ever in team racing. We'll rebound quickly next year, so don't worry about that. <laughs> but um, uh, Stanford, uh, they have to fly to, e to every regatta where there's going to be good competition. It's sometimes as many as uh, three events in a weekend on the East Coast for Stanford, averaging at least once a week uh, flying to the East Coast. Uh, that's got to take some toll. Uh, so they always seem to be contenders, and they always seem to end up uh, bubble between making the Final Four or just the Gold Eight. Uh, I wonder, you know, if, if, if perhaps this is the year with these particular players and Will Adal being the superstar from San Diego, is this the year that they break out and make it into the Final Four? It could be. I, I think they actually did make the Final Four last year, uh, finishing, uh, actually maybe the last two years even, finishing third, I want to say, both these last couple years at Team Race National. So they have been in the mix. Um, but like you said, Ken, I think the Stanford team has some distinct disadvantages, along with the Dartmouth team, um, but, but more so Stanford, because they're flying across the country every weekend, and, and their sailors, uh, they're either sailing across the country frequently, or they're not getting as much competition as some of our sailors in the East Coast might get, because our sailors just have the benefit of being so much closer. But beyond that, uh, and I know it's talked about a lot, but a lot of people may not know that Stanford, uh, they're still in school right now because they're on the quarter system. Oh, right. They're still in school, and uh, I believe they go into exams this week. Yeah. So Dartmouth look, maybe also. Yeah, Dartmouth look, is as well. Yeah, looking both, over at their tents, you see, that you see a lot of their players in between races when they have their bye. They're 
got their yeah. textbooks open and get some assignments Yeah, they're not fun. exactly easy schools. You pay a lot of money. You better come out of there with a good <laughs> education. And this is, uh, it, you know, it's coming into crunch time for exams for them. So to have the stress of college nationals, the stress of the last week of classes, term papers, and studying for exams, and then even taking your exams during college nationals, mm. that's a pretty big disadvantage that they have to overcome. So I think that's been a struggle for them over the years at nationals. But I also think, you know, I think Stanford, as many talented players as they have, they're still a bit of a growing program. They don't have that institutional success that schools like BC and St. Mary's have, where year after year they've been here, they've been in the top competition. Like we said with St. Mary's, they've always got a strong second team. And I think Stanford's still developing that. So I think, you know, we, we've seen them in the top Final Four the last couple of years, and I, I don't think they're going away from that fringe conversation. I'm just not sure with graduating so many of their players from last year that we're going to be able to see them make the push for yeah, the Final Four this year. I do see some turnover year. there with mm -hmm. that team, unlike Charleston, who's had the same players four years in a row. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, Dartmouth circumvents that ice problem a little better than you might think. Their team is small. Uh, they only have first, second, and third string. And the first string, it, uh, it takes the van to Boston and trains with the Boston schools during the spring. They also, uh, yeah, they have that weird quarter system, weird compared to everyone else. It's normal for them. Uh, but it, it allows them other times during the year that they can do training trips, such as December. They're in Charleston training with Charleston pretty hard. Uh, then in March, they've got uh, a nice break where they're training. And then in, uh, during ice time of uh, later March and early April, they are going to Boston, and then the ice broke early for them. So uh, it, it, it hurts their second and third string, the ice problem, but their first string has the resources to get to where uh, the, both the competition and the better weather is. Oh, no, no, no. I think, I think they make the best of their situation. I mean, they do a great job training that trip down in uh, down Charleston every December. I just think uh, as they go into the spring, they're just a little bit less practiced, a little bit less fresh than every other team to some extent. I mean, they do, they do everything they can to get down to Nisa every weekend, or rather get down to Boston, uh, or rather weekdays. Um, but their players can't go every day of the week. So, you know, they're lacking just that little bit of extra practice time, which, you know, to their credit, they're here at the national championship uh, and, they're, and they're, you know, made into the top eight. So props to them for getting this far and doing that. Um, they're certainly not letting those dance disadvantages get them down in any, any respect, but it is just something to, you know, that's thrown into the mix that's, that's worth talking about with, with, you know, their situation going to nationals and their particular challenges that they Boy, have to I'm face. I'm a big fan of Dartmouth's freshman, Chris Williford. Uh, he underwent a long, a tough battle with cancer. I saw him several times at Boston Children's Hospital, uh, and it was it was rough for a while. But, but I mean, obviously he was determined, and uh, even though there were setbacks, uh, he had he had a, a long string of goals, and he's got to be matching those goals. A freshman at two Mason Nationals. Uh, that's definitely tremendous, and we're saying now Dartmouth getting every advantage they can and finding it. And who's the first team we see out here on the water right now? But the Dartmouth Big Green as the How about competitors that? are starting to uh, launch their boats. We had a bit of a wind delay this morning. It was a little glassy when we all got here, but it's starting to fill in here in San Diego at the uh, cruise ship terminal, and the race committee is starting to motor motor out to the course to drop some marks. So we might be uh, might be getting some racing soon within the next 20 or 30 oh, minutes. Good. But until then, I think we're going to take a quick break until the action starts to heat up, let the competitors get out on the water. So. Folks, we'll be back with you soon. Uh, as soon as they start hearing horns, we'll be right here with you here in San Diego for the 2016 ICSA Ladies Performance Team Race National Championship. We'll be right back with you. Good job, guys. Nice job.